Good. And you can see my pointer now. Yay, it's red. Um, all right, welcome guys uh, and gals. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, HMMs number two. So this is a read from last time. We are now uh, in the last lecture of uh, module number two. So tomorrow will be a student holiday. So we have two options. One is to come in during the holiday. Just kidding. And then the other one is to just hold the material from this week, next week. Okay. Um, is anybody interested in actually coming in on the holidays? No? Yes? No? Raise your hands if you are. There will be office hours. Yeah, we will have office hours. So I'm having office hours right after this at 2.30. And then um, we'll have office hours on Monday and stuff like that. Or on Friday. Okay. So uh, student holiday, enjoy it. Go to the career fair. That's what it's supposed to be. Get an awesome job or internship. And then uh, we'll have registration again next week. So, just to review, what did we see uh, last time? So, uh, for today, we're, first we're going to review what HMMs are all about, and you know, review this calculating of x comma pi, uh, calculating the Viterbi uh, algorithm of uh, pi star, which gives you the maximum uh, score path, and then the forward algorithm of the total probability. Then we're going to talk about posterior decoding. How do we find the most likely state by I over all paths? And then we're going to uh, touch upon uh, new material. So basically, how do we increase the state space? How do we add memory? So these processes, Markov chains, are memoryless. How do you encode memory? By increasing the state space. So we're going to look at two examples of uh, increasing state space. So first, how do we find CPG islands, so dinucleotides? to remember the previous nucleotide. And then we're going to look at two real-world examples, so GenScan and Chrome HMM. Uh, one for uh, finding genes, the other one for annotating non-coding regions. And uh, then we're going to switch to learning. So this is the bottom uh, third of these algorithms that we saw uh, for how to do supervised learning and then unsupervised learning. And that's basically the main course. The rest is just desserts, uh, and sometimes we're more creative with desserts, so it might turn out a little sour. Uh, but uh, we're going to talk about conditional random fields. So one way of extending uh, hidden Markov models to actually do conditional training, as the uh, name implies. So random means probabilistic, field means there's graphs and stuff, and then uh, conditional means uh, conditional training instead of generative. <laughs> Sounds good? So uh, this was uh, how we motivated uh, hidden Markov models. Basically, the concept is you're getting a new DNA sequence. You don't know what it is. So instead of just aligning it, what you want to do now is basically figure out whether it belongs in a class of sequences that you know and love. So the way to do that is to basically model the different classes of sequences probabilistically based on their properties. And then using these properties, we can emit an actual instance of that class by running our model forward and generating sequences because it's a generative model. It can just emit sequences by going through the transition emission uh, exercise. We can just basically transition with some probability, whatever state we're in, we're going to emit with some probability according to that probability emission table of that state. Everybody clear with that? Good. Number two, we want to be able to recognize DNA sequences of a certain type. And that's where Bayes' rule comes in. So instead of uh, having this forward probability of emitting a particular character given a hidden state, what we're going to say is that given that I've observed a particular character, what is the most likely hidden state that may have generated that character? Everybody with me here? So we're going to reverse the conditional probability of emission given state to calculate state given emission. Okay? And then there's many ways of doing that. One way is to basically look at the combined uh, probability of observing the entire hidden path given the set of observations x. And that can be done multiple ways. One way is to look at the pi star, which is the Spiterby algorithm. And then the other way is to look at pi hat, which is the forward algorithm, the um, um, posterior decoding algorithm. So basically, the question here is what hidden states most likely have generated the observations? Basically, find the set of states and transitions that generated a long sequence. And then today, we're going to talk about the ability to learn the characteristics of each of those sequences. 
So the nomenclature that we introduced was pi, was a series of, um, it was a vector uh, indexed by i, the position that we're looking at, that had the state at each of the position. And then x was the observation that again had uh, a character for each position. Then we had a transition uh, vector that basically told us what is the, um, you know, probability of transitioning from state K to state L, regardless of what the sequence looks like. This only depends on the state K. And then the probability of emission of emitting a particular character, again, completely independent of the position that I'm at. It only depends on the state K that I'm in. So then AKL was the probability of transitioning to state L, given that the previous state was K, regardless of the emissions. And then the emission probability was the probability of emitting character xi, given that the state is k. Everybody completely with me here? Awesome. All right, so uh, the first example that we looked at was a two-state Kid Markov model with a background state and a promoter state with 10% probability of, or, yes, 10% probability of transitioning from background out, and then 5% probability of transitioning from promoter out. And then a uniform emission matrix for background and a biased GC rich promoter um, state. Okay. So then the six algorithms that we laid out in this uh, two dimensional grid was number one, scoring E x comma pi, decoding the maximum likelihood path, I star, given uh, our observation x. Scoring the total probability of observing that sequence X, regardless of which path I chose. So summing over of the top path, the second best path, the third best path, all the way down, each weighted by their probability. And then posterior decoding was effectively another way of decoding, another way of annotating the set of hidden states that most likely corresponds to that sequence. Whereas, but, but instead of looking at a single path, it was looking at a chimeric path where at every position, it was simply choosing the hidden state that maximized the total probability summed, or, summed over all paths of emitting that character from that state, given the entire sequence. Okay, everybody with me on this? Great, so these algorithms were number one, uh, basically going through and multiplying things across, transition, emission, transition, emission, transition, emission, all the way through. And then that gave us a score for a particular sequence and path. Then we basically looked at how we can calculate the maximum score. And the way that we did that was by defining this Viterbi variable that was basically storing the score of the best decoding that ends in state J at position I minus one. And then given that score for the previous position, for each of the states, and we could calculate the score at the current position for each of the states by basically taking the transition probability, the previous score, and then the emission probability from the current state of the current character. Okay? And that basically gave us VK of I as basically being the product of the emission probability times the maximum of all those choices. And for every one of the choices, I'm combining the maximum score that I get, which is that probability, times the transition. And again, there was a one-to-one -one mapping between log probabilities or minus log probabilities and scores, enabling us to actually carry out the computation efficiently. Using this, we could calculate the maximum score over an exponential number of possible paths in polynomial time, simply by going through the matrix once. And that allowed us to calculate each of n times k entries, each of which was calculated using order k time, giving us an order k square n time algorithm and an order k n space algorithm. Okay? Who's with me so far? Raise your hands. Awesome. Lovely. So for the total probability of observing a particular sequence x summed over all possible paths, we did exactly the same thing as for the Viterbi algorithm. We calculated a forward variable 
which again encapsulated the calculation at the previous position, but now summed over all possibilities. So basically, this gave us the total probability, and there was an equivalent backward algorithm that was doing exactly the same computation backward. We combined the forward algorithm and the reverse and the backward algorithm by basically uh, being able to calculate the total probability of emitting character A from a particular state, summed over all paths that lead to that state and all paths exiting that state. And we could do that through the forward algorithm ending here and then the backward algorithm ending there, making sure that only the forward algorithm calculates the emission probability, not double counting. Okay, ready with me? Great. And then uh, we basically reasoned about three different ways of calculating that total probability of emitting A. If I observe nothing, of, sorry, the total probability of being in state B given that I observe A. If I observe nothing, it's just the prior information. Is it B or is it B? Based on their relative coverage of the gene. If I observe the character A, and I'm also incorporating the um, emission probability in addition to the prior information. And if I observe the entire sequence, that's when posterior decoding became. Okay. Yeah. To observe what? Aha, yes. <laughs> Thank you. So to observe nothing basically means that if I say, what is the most likely annotation for chromosome 13, position 325? I, you know, I don't tell you what the sequence is there. What you'll tell me is, I know nothing about that. So it's just gonna be that promoters cover 5% of the genome. So the probability is gonna be 5% promoter, 95% the rest, background. But then if you observe a series of A's, then you'll basically say, aha, this is not GC rich, this is AT rich. So I'm gonna reduce the probability of being in promoter state. And that takes that particular emission into account. And then if I observe the entire sequence of the genome, then I want to know what is the probability of going of being a promoter here. I can do that with Viterbi training, with Viterbi, uh, the Viterbi algorithm, by basically saying, given the best parts of the genome, what is the probability of being here? But that best parts of the genome only tells me about one path. But maybe the second path has just as much probability, and the third path has just as much probability. Each of those even for a sequence of length 10, was one in a billion. And therefore captures only a small fraction of the total probability. And therefore you want to sum over all the possible paths to traverse either promoter or background. And then you can calculate the true total probability regardless of the path. Everybody with me? Yeah. Microphone. <laughs> awesome. Tapping to it? Actually, you can't tell. No, never mind. It's okay. It's not on? All right, it's on. There's no feedback. Good. Um, uh, can you comment on when you Yeah, so um, it's, um, it's kind of like when do you put, I don't know, strawberry versus mango? It's a question of taste. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, basically, pie hat is if I want to bet my entire fortune on this one character, that's probably what I'm going to choose. I star is if I want something that's sensible for the whole genome. Does that make sense? So if I want to bet over the entire genome, pi star is the way to go. If I want to bet on one character, pi hat is the way to go. And if I want to bet on one character for each of the genome independently, then pi hat is the way to go. Pi hat will give you better probability at every position, but it might give you a completely nonsensical path. It might go from third exome to first exome, which is nonsensical. But given all the evidence, the most likely state was first exome. So that's what I'm going to bet on if that's the only thing that I'm caring about, because I don't care about all the other paths and how nonsensical they might be. Whereas by star will basically give me something that is actually sensible. Make sense? Any other microphone? Yeah, 
Ah, multi-class, it's exactly the same math. Multi-class is exactly the same math. It's basically telling you, you know, for each of the states, uh, you know, what is the total probability? Yeah, three states here, market one. Oh, um, they're not exclusive categories. So CPG Island and GC Rich Region are not exclusive categories. So what you would need to do is build an HMM that has three classes, for example, CPG with um, high conservation and CPG with low conservation and non-CPG. That could be your three classes. And then you classify according to those three classes and then the math is the same. Does that make sense? Other questions? Cool. All right, that's for the review. So basically, we have learned about Markov chains and human Markov models, the basics and the algorithms. We learned about how to calculate this, how to calculate pi star, how to calculate you know, the total probability, and how to calculate pi hat with the security code. So instead of doing more algorithms, let's now step back and say, what do we use these HMMs for? And we're going to look at how to increase the state space. We talked about CPG islands. That has a memory of, oh, you know, it's not just a, I mean, I mean a G, and the previous character was a C. But we talked about how Markov chains are memoryless. They don't have memory. So how do we encode memory? We're going to basically take every state, we're going to explode it into, expand it into four states. If I'm in the current state and the last character was a C, I'm going to take the current state and make it into four. Current state n, previous character was a C. Current state n, previous character was a G. Current state n, previous character was a T. Current state, current state n, previous character was an A. Sounds good? So that's how I remember anything in a human Markov model. So if I want to encode that the previous state was one of four possibilities, I need four states for every current state. Who's with me on this one? <laughs> Some people, not everybody. All right, let's uh, look at it. So how do we increase the state space? So how do we remember more? The first HMM we looked at was only C's and G's matter for our promoter. The second HMM we're gonna look at is actually CPG's. First of all, why do CPG's matter? Because um, methylation, DNA methylation, happens primarily on CPG dinucleotide. So P basically means phosphate backbone. Remember that first lecture with uh, you know, DNA having a base here, phosphate, base here, phosphate, base here. So basically, this is the phosphate part. That's what Spider Man does, he's right, phosphate. Um, <laughs> so, so basically, base, phosphate, base, phosphate, base, phosphate. So that's why when I say CPG, I basically mean there's a C, there's a phosphate, and then there's a G. Okay? Because otherwise, I might, you might get confused with the GC base pair. Okay? This is just a CG base pair and a GC base pair. Sounds good? So that's what CPG means. Everybody clear with what CPG means? Good. So that's why CPGs matter, because methylation actually cares about, about that. So basically, because Markov chains, Markov model and Markov chain are memoryless, all memory is encoded in the state. To remember additional information, I need to augment that state. So two states, you know, GC rich versus non GC rich. Has minimal memory. It only remembers the current character. state and the emissions only depend on the current state. And the current state only encodes one current nucleotide. So how do you count dinucleotide frequencies for CPG islands or for example for codons trinucleotide frequencies or for dicodon frequencies six nucleotides? You expand the number of states. So basically instead of having only a CPG plus, or sorry, a GC plus and a GC minus region, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically encode an HMM with eight states. And each of the states is going to correspond to, you know, one of uh, either the current or the next state. Current position, actually, sorry. This is a plus state or a minus state. So basically, and again, there should be minuses for half of them. So this is, I'm in a CPG island and the previous character was an A. I'm in a CPG island and the previous character was a G. I'm in a CPG, I'm outside a CPG island and the previous character was a C. Does that make sense? So basically, I'm remembering the previous character at the same time that I'm remembering what state I'm in. 
Okay, any questions on this? Raise your hand if you have any questions. So again, there's, you know, two bits of information, you know, one of four possibilities. That's how I'm remembering things. So basically I need, you know, the, basically the number of states is simply directly proportional to just the number of options that I have. Okay. So the memory of the previous input that is encoded in a different state. And now what can I emit from an A plus character or an A minus character? What can I emit? What are my options? A, C, G, and T. What is the probability of emitting a G? I heard it. Say it again. Zero. What is the probability of emitting an A? One. Basically, if I'm in this particular state at the current position, so basically I'm remembering the current position, then I effectively can only emit this particular character. So basically, I'm in an A in a CPG island, I'm in an A in a CP minus island, and so forth. So all of the information is basically now starting to be encoded in the um, transitions. So basically, you know. So because we have, you know, so many different parameters, every transition basically gets its own probability. So basically to encode that there's a dinucleotide A and C, I can simply transition from the A nucleotide to the C nucleotide with whatever frequency the A C nucleotide appears. Does that make sense? So basically, if I have in a CPG plus state, A followed by A, A followed by C, A followed by G, A followed by T, is simply each of these frequencies is encoded in the transition probability. Because the emission vector is kind of boring. All the emission vector is basically saying is I'm remembering the current character when I go to the next state. Basically, when I transition from an A to a G, then the memory that the previous character was an A is simply the fact that I'm coming from the A state. Okay? So now, when I define my probabilities, I don't just have simply an emission that basically tells me, you know, before I had eight parameters effectively in addition to the transition probabilities. I had eight emission parameters. And those emission parameters were simply the probability of ACGT according to each of the states. Right now, I have 16 parameters for each of the states in addition to the transition parameters between CPG plus and CPG minus. So it's equivalent to having emission parameters that are much richer because now I need to worry about the probability of dinucleotides. Okay? Who's with me on this? Raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome. Good. Any questions? I have a question for you guys. What's an alternative way of encoding this? Right now, what I did is I encoded everything on the transition probabilities. What else could I have done? Rolling up my sleeves on this one. So what else could I do? Sorry, say it again? Of pairs, yes. So expand on this, this is nice. Yeah. You have to speak up. Okay, other, other idea? So tell me more. You're basically saying pairs. What do you mean by pairs? And how would I do that? Exactly, who said that? Great. The emissions, tell me more. So, sure, sure. And basically every state emits a dinucleotide. What is the challenge there? So I'm emitting a dinucleotide, and now I go to the next state that emits a dinucleotide as well. 
So that basically means that, yeah, exactly, exactly. So basically, I can either emit overlapping dinucleotides, which then is problematic, because the probability of emitting CA and the probability of emitting AP are very coupled, or I could space them, and then the problem is that I suddenly am I'm missing half of the transition, which might be okay, because I, you know, I may not need to transition exactly at the right nucleotide. You know, I just emit dinucleotides. And then the, pro the next problem is that one dinucleotide and the other dinucleotide are coupled. So basically, you know, if I emit this and I emit that, I need to also take into account that the dinucleotide frequency here might be weird. Okay? So that's why it's much more straightforward to actually encode this at the transition space, where every character emits one nucleotide and then the transitions encode the dinucleotide pattern. And what you can see here is that CPG islands, for example, have C followed by G much more frequently than non-CPG islands, which have a much lower probability. Why is that? That's because in a methylated state, as soon as the genome is methylated, the CPG deaminates and the C turns into a T. So in the human genome, when a CPG dinucleotide gets methylated, it is very likely to then have it turn into a TPG or a CPA, which would be a TPG on the opposite strand. Okay? So basically, very often, CPGs turn into TPGs or CPAs. It means that one of the two gets deaminated, basically loses you know, uh, an amino group and turns from a C into a T. So that means that for the vast majority of the human genome, which is methylated, the vast majority of the human genome is methylated, for that vast majority of the human genome, you basically have very few CPGs. And therefore, when you find CPGs together, it, mean that, it means that this region is simply not methylated. And that basically means that this region is not repressed, and that's usually a sign of an active regulatory region. And that's why promoters are marked by CPG islands in the human genome because that's where methylation is not occurring. Gene methylation is not occurring. Okay? So there's a DNA signature of the DNA methylation process because of the deamination of CPG dinucleotides, leading to a depletion of CPGs. And that is also why we observe the related signature of lower GC content. I showed you on the previous lecture how GC islands in the human gene, so how promoters in the human genome are actually very rich in G and C. And the reason for that is because when you lose CPG dinucleotides, you also lose Cs and G. Everybody with me so far? Great. Cool. So does that make sense? So sort of how we increase the state space to remember the previous character? That's exactly right. So basically, what you're going to do is that any transition from CPG plus to CPG minus is going to have exactly the same probability. And any transition from minus to plus will have exactly the same probability. And any transition from minus to minus will have exactly the same probability, and so on and so forth. The only things that get sort of interesting things are, you know, these guys. You're effectively, you can think of it as adding a layer, a multiple, uh, multiple anyway, a factor with which you multiply things. Um, depending on whether you're going from minus to plus, from plus to minus, and also, you know, these cross factors that basically tell you about the dinucleotide frequencies. Okay? So basically, the interesting transitions are here and here, but all the cross transitions are kind of boring. Okay? I mean, they're not boring, they're either, they're all the same value from here to there and from there to here, and they simply encode the relative. Uh, state duration probabilities in this geometric follow. All right, so um, this was basically the first example with GC rich regions. We had two states, different nucleotide composition, GC rich versus AT rich. Then for CPG islands, we had eight states, four each for CPG plus and four each for CPG minus with different transition probabilities. 
and that captures CPG rich and CPG poor. And that, you know, the level, um, basically what we were detecting was simply, you know, dinucleotides. So we can also detect protein coding exons or protein coding gene structures. So let's talk a little bit about that. So basically when we're talking about architecture, uh, you know, we want to know where the genes are and the genes are what makes RNA and ultimately makes protein. And they start with an ET gene. They stop with one of three stop codons. And they have coding regions and introns. The coding regions are called exons and the intervening regions are called introns. Introns are spliced when you observe a donor site and acceptor site, which are basically brought together by enzymes. These are actually RNA machinery mostly. And basically attach them to the uh, GT that becomes the donor site. It then searches an acceptor site. It makes a loop on the DNA, on the RNA, and then it joins them together. And then you get the, you know, the first exon, the second intron makes a loop, gets excised out, Next action, and so on and so forth, okay? So Phil Sharp uh, from the biology department got a Nobel Prize for recognizing the existence of uh, introns and basically finding these, you know, loops and then, you know, uh, discovering splicing. Um, and, you know, <laughs> that was a pretty fundamental discovery. And if you look at before and after the coding region, there, what we call untranslated regions. So UTRs, these regions are transcribed into mRNA, but they're not translated into protein, okay? So how do we make a hidden Markov model to recognize this? What we need is a state that remembers that we're in a UTR. We need a state that remembers that we're in an intron. We need a state that recognizes a transition from non-coding to coding and the ATG states that recognize the stop to non-coding and so on and so forth, okay? So what we're gonna end up with is this kind of structure where you basically have, you know, a bunch of nucleotides. You can just keep, you know, transitioning yourself in this state and just emit individual nucleotides. And then at some point you might discover a type of binding factor landing site. And then the five prime untranslated region, then you start into the ATG, and then you're in the first exon. And then you have a donor site, and you enter the first intron, at which point you can go back to an acceptor site and you go to the final uh, exon. Or you could go back into another acceptor and the first exon, donor. Acceptor, exon, donor. Okay? and then back out here. And then the final exon is effectively ending with an TAG or TGA or TAA. And then the untranslated region. And then this is the polyadenylation signal at the end of the transcript. And then back to emitting individual nucleotides. Okay? Sometimes you might not recognize the TATA and the ATA. So what you can do is simply go to the ATG, back to the TAG. Okay? Have I told you about all of the states? states I didn't tell you about. Which ones? The acceptor and the donor are basically these guys here. So this is the uh, donor and then this is the acceptor. This is just the splice signals that basically tell you how to go from an exon to an intern and how to bring the two interns together. The splice signals are primarily encoded in the intern, which is convenient. That gives you more freedom in the exon. But there are exonic signals that also encode splice site information. So what you can do here is in the exonic state, what you could emit is triplets of nucleotides. Or you could actually encode the different frequencies of each base in separate states. So how is that possible? By basically having transitions between the, uh, you know, 
phase offset. So basically the reason why we have X and Z, so why do we have three states here, E0, E1, and E2? Sorry, say it again. Uh, the different codon frames, right? Yeah, so the frame of codon translation is what we need to remember. Because if I'm in the you know, first exon, for example, and I have two nucleotides and I need a third nucleotide to complete my exon, then through my long, long intron, I need to remember that I'm missing a nucleotide. And I can only start my second exon in the third codon position. Okay? So that's why we have these three, is it basically let us remember whether we saw a sufficient number of nucleotides to complete a codon. So what I would have liked to uh, have in this diagram is transition from E0, E1, E2, E1, and, you know, basically tuck, 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 tuck transitions that would basically allow me to, you know, remember what frame I'm in and then when I exit, I would have to remember that frame, okay? But unfortunately, this diagram doesn't show that. All right? So that's how I remember the frame. Everybody clear with the complexity of hidden Markov models? Basically, what they allow you to do is encode all of these different classes of elements as separate entities. So I want to give you a different example from the epigenomic world. We're going to, yeah. Because, um, so I think the transition probabilities are incorrectly labeled here. I have to go from zero to one to two back to zero. So I can fix this diagram, uh, but it was taken from the paper. Um, uh, but uh, once I'm in intron zero, I should only transition to intron zero. And then, you know, I can only go back to X and one, for example. So I'll have to redraw this from scratch and um, make this clear. But basically the three exonic states, are remembering what nucleotide I'm in according to the frame. I'm in the first codon position, second codon position, third codon position. And then the uh, introns have to similarly remember whether I came in the corresponding intron position. And then the acceptor and the donor are sort of the transitions between uh, exons and introns. Okay? All right. So I don't want you to just think about nucleotides as the only thing that we can emit from here with models. So I want you to also think about epigenomic space or pretty much any kind of uh, sequential pattern along the DNA or across time. So, uh, you know, just as a preview of the epigenomic lecture, there's three different classes of epigenomic modifications, DNA accessibility, DNA methylation in CBG nucleotides, and then histone modifications. And these histone modifications happen at the level of 200 nucleotides. So basically, there's 147 nucleotides that are wrapped around eight histone proteins that make up a nucleosome. There's about a 50 nucleotide linker, which of course can vary greatly. And then you have these long amino acid tails, which can be post-translationally modified by adding methylation marks, acetylation marks, and so on. These combinations of marks can be detected using chromatin immunoprecipitation, which we're going to talk about in the epigenomics lecture, ending up with maps of where are different marks in different positions. So here are all of the different marks, H3K4, uh, K14 acetylation, H3K27 acetylation, a bunch of different acetylation marks, all 2 CTCF, H2AZ, and a bunch of methylation marks. And you can see sort of that combinations appear in different places. So what I can do now is describe a hidden Markov model that allows me to recognize different classes of elements, enhancers, promoters, transcribers, and repressed regions, based on their characteristic combinations of histone modification marks. The hidden Markov model is perfectly suited for this. Basically, there's a set of hidden states, which basically tell me what is the epigenomic state of the chromatin at that location, and it allows me to translate the observable combinations of individual histone modification marks into a set of interpretable chromatin states. Okay? 
So this is one such model, which has been very, very popular. This was developed by Jason Ernst, who was a postdoc in my lab. Uh, so we have a series of papers uh, on this. This is basically from the original paper that was basically saying, hey, listen, you can take combinations of marks. You can express these combinations in a hidden market model. And then the hidden state of that model immediately tell you where are promoter regions. And you see that these correspond exactly to the promoter region of that gene. Where are the early, middle, and late transcribed regions? Where are the active regions that are surrounding expressed genes? And where are the repressed regions further on? So this model was completely unsupervised. We didn't tell it what the transition emission probabilities were. We learned it using the algorithm that we're about to see, on Welch algorithm, on Welch training, expectation optimization. And basically what we did is let loose a hidden Markov model that would emit these chromatin marks with different probability, depending on the state that you're in. We basically told it, why don't you go and learn, I don't know, 50 states for 41 different marks instead of the 2 to the 41, which would be a lot. We basically said, let's learn a very small number of states, 50, that encode all possible combinations that are recurrent in the genome. And what you can see here is that it, it is able to actually pick out gene structures without even looking at the DNA sequence. It just looks at the epigenomic marks at that location. Who's with me on, on this so far? Raise your hands. Awesome. Any questions? Again, every single state is about 200 base pairs. So we chop up the genome to 100 base pair intervals. And then we basically say, how do I interpret each of those intervals as I go through the genome? And what's different here is that instead of emitting a single letter, I'm emitting a, a vector of observations. So here, I'm emitting an entire vector of these histone modification mark. So that allows me to encode within the state of the model, it allows me to encode combinations that are meaningful. Okay. So I have basically a Markov chain that tells me how likely am I to transition from each state to the other state. We have a vector of observations for each of the histone modification marks. And then we have a set of transition probabilities between the states and a set of emission probabilities from each of the states. So if I'm in the first state, I emit this mark with this probability. In the second state, I emit this mark with this probability, and so on and so forth. And all of the probabilities are learned from the data. And then the emission distribution is simply a product of independent Bernoulli random variables. Okay? So this is what the model parameters actually look like. This is the emission matrix. Basically tell me that for every state, every row is a state. And in this state, I emit a vector of marks with this probability. In that state, I emit a vector of marks with this probability. So that means that I can encode the fact that these marks tend to co-occur in this state. But then these other marks tend to co-occur in this other state, and so, so forth. Basically, these marks tend to co-occur here, and these marks tend to co-occur here, and I can learn that in a state conditional fashion. And then the transition matrix basically tells me how likely am I to stay in a promoter state from a promoter state, in a transcribed state, in an enhancer state, and so on and so forth. Okay? Who's with me so far? Awesome. Good. So, what have we done? We basically reviewed the basic algorithms of HMMs, and then we looked at increasing levels of complexity. We went from having a two-stated HMM that detects CPG, sorry, tissue-rich regions, to an eight-state HMM that detects CPG islands, where the eight states are used to encode the memory of the previous nucleotide. And then we looked at a um, you know, bunch of states for uh, gene prediction, and then we also looked at, um, you know, with a complex set of transitions between them. And then, uh, so this was complexity at the transition level, but it was still emitting a single nucleotide at a time. And then the Chrome HMM uh, example was basically looking at increased complexity on the emission space at a relatively flat, um, you know, transition uh, probability matrix that was treating everything uniformly and simply learning from the data. 
So these models have been extremely, extremely popular. So GenScan was extremely used for decades for finding genes. And then ChromHMM has been used very heavily for the past you know, eight uh, years or so for finding uh, you know, annotations of epigenome. Okay. We're gonna take a quick break and then we're gonna dive into learning. So um just touch. <laughs> So we have so far seen the top parts of these um, algorithms, basically how to score a single path uh, and a single annotation, uh, basically a single emission X and a single annotation Pi path, how to find the, be the best path, uh, how to score X using all paths, and how to find the most likely state in every position, and then make some kind of memory path from that. We're now going to move to the bottom of these, and you know, from scoring to decoding to learning. And we're going to look at two modes, supervised learning and then unsupervised learning. So that basically allows us to find the set of parameters, lambda, that maximize the probability of emitting uh, sequence X given path by. And for unsupervised learning, basically what we're going to be maximizing is over all possible paths, find the maximum path, and then again, maximize the set of parameters given that annotation. And for unsupervised learning, we're going to be basically maximizing over the set of parameters. But instead of taking the maximum path, we're going to be summing over all paths very similar to the relationship between, you know, Viterbi uh, and posterior decoder. So, let's talk first about supervised learning. How to train your uh, track, um, how to train your regimen. So, the transition probability basically tells you what is the probability with which I'm going to transition to a promoter state, given that I'm in a background state, okay? If I have an annotation, how do I calculate this? If I have the annotation of my sequence, and I have a bunch of B's and a bunch of P's annotated already, how do I calculate the probability of transitioning from B to P? What is the maximum likelihood estimate of that probability? Yes. Mm -hmm. Just by counting, what do I count? Yeah. So. Anybody wants to give me the exact equation that I'm going to be using? So first I'm going to count how many times was I in a B state, okay? That's going to be my denominator and what's going to be my numerator. Raise your hand if you know the answer. One, two, three, go for it. Exactly. Basically from all the times I was in a B state, how many times is it transition to a P? Okay. And then the B to B, not to be confused with B to B, um, is going to be simply one minus that. Okay. Because the rest of the time that I was in a B state, I transitioned to a B. State. And similarly for P, just to calculate this P to B probability, I just count the number of times I was in a B state. That's my denominator. And then how many times did I transition to B? That's my numerator, and then the fraction of that is the maximum likelihood estimate of the P to B transition. Okay, everybody with me so far? What about the emission probabilities? How do I calculate the probability of emitting an A? How do I estimate the probability of, of emitting an A if I'm in the B state? Yeah. Exactly, divided by the number of times I went into B state. Okay. Everybody with me so far? Good. So you guys are totally on top of this. So basically, you know, I can just go back here and check out. Basically, supervised learning, if I know my annotation, is trivial. I simply calculate those maximum likelihood estimates, which is simply counting. Okay? People keep asking me, hey, how do you estimate these variables? Well, if I have an annotation, that's trivial. I just count. Okay? 
What's the problem with just counting? You have a very short sequence. You just make never observe an A emitted from the background state. Uh, if you have many, many states, I just might never observe the transition from, I don't know, the terminal exon to the UTR position, okay? So that can actually be problematic, okay? And the way we deal with that, uh, it basically, this, this is called overfitting. Basically, when we know the underlying states, the best estimates is the average frequency of transitions and emissions that occur in the training data. But the problem with that is that given little data, there may be overfitting. P of x, you know, given the set of parameters, might be maximized, but the set of parameters might be completely unreasonable. And specifically, if I never observe something, that can be very, very bad. Basically, given 10 nucleotides, I might observe this, and then I might just infer that I just never transition from P to B. So how do I deal with that? The way to deal with that is to basically include some small number to every probability, to every count. So it, it, I'll be a little off in my calculations, but it just won't create any zeros. So basically, this is what we call pseudo counts. Basically, AKL is simply the number of times that I transition from K to L, you know, plus some small um, counts there. And then similarly for this, okay? So these are pseudo counts that actually represent our prior belief. This R can be simply the rate that I expect, and then I can just adjust that rate based on my observations. So with larger pseudo counts, that basically corresponds to a stronger prior belief. And with small pseudo counts, I can just avoid zero probability. Everybody here with me on the sort of supervised learning and then adding pseudo counts to avoid overfitting. Okay. And then this is exactly how we had ended up with these numbers. Basically, what we had said is what is the number of times that I observed the transition from, you know, P to G uh, for each of the, you know, characters in a big, big set of annotated CPG island and in a big, big set of annotated non cpg okay. So, now for the magic. How do I do unsupervised learning? I, I, I know absolutely nothing about my sequence. In the case of an HMM, we basically said, I don't know where the promoters and the enhancers and transcribed regions are. I'm just going to give 50 states of the model. I'm going to tell it, partition the data as you see best fit. And it will just choose annotations based on that. So how do I do that? I have one answer here. Any other ideas? Two ideas? Oh, yeah. Question. Sorry, go ahead. That's a very good point. So basically, the number of states is a parameter that chooses the complexity or the resolution of my model. I can tune it to basically say, I want an extremely detailed model or I want an extremely coarse model. So you could infer that, and there are techniques such as you know, Bayesian information criteria and stuff like that, that basically penalize the number of parameters and basically says, given that penalty for the number of parameters, how much explainability do I have about the world and where is that ratio of power versus explainability uh, get maximized. So there are ways of doing that. The problem with genomes is that the more you know, parameters you throw at them, the more parameters they'll use. Genomes are just extremely complex. It's very hard to use these sort of formal probabilistic theory approaches to tune the complexity of the model. So usually we err on the side of interpretability and we choose less complex models that we can then interpret more fully. Uh, Turns out my microphone was off the whole time. We'll see how that goes. Oopsie. I don't know if any of the other ones were on. Oops. Hey, you know what? I've been recording this lecture with my phone. Yay. <laughs> this is called backup. Uh, we'll see what we can do. We'll splice together some audio here. All right. Any uh, suggestions for how we can do unsupervised learning? Yes. Microphone. Oh, 
oh, you know what we're going to do in the future? You're going to have a little microphone. You can basically tell if the audio is coming on correctly without getting too sure. <laughs> Awesome. Good. Sorry about that. Yes. <laughs> No, 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 but, but just repeat your idea. I'm sorry, I was getting distracted. Mm -hmm. This is answering his question, right? Yeah, basically what I'm asking is a simpler question. Suppose that I tell the model I want 50 states and I don't give it any training data. How would you go about learning things? So I have an answer here and an answer back there. Uh, is there a microphone on this side of the room? Um, can you... Speak up though, even though you have a mic. Very cool. Uh, there was another question back there. Can you press the other one? Sorry, it comes with some annotation and then you do what? Ah, very cool. So what you're saying is make some fake parameters, and what you're saying is make some fake sequence, right? Basically start with some zero parameters, and you're saying start, start with some random annotation. And then the iteration is the same, right? Good. You guys are awesome. Any other comments? Yeah, these are basically the two approaches, uh, spot on. So basically, the way that we do unsupervised learning is if we don't have, you know, any labels and we don't have any annotations it's very hard to start but what we could do is we start with some parameters or we start we start with some annotations and then given some set of parameters at iteration zero we could calculate the most likely path given those parameters and then update the parameters based on this most likely path and then use the updated parameters to calculate a better path and use the better path to calculate better parameters so, so forth. Okay. Why would this even work ever? Like my son says, in the whole world ever. I want answer. Two answers. Any answers? Go ahead. Yeah, but why would that work? I want some intuition. Okay. Okay. Press the mic. Okay. Yeah, that's why it might not work. Like, why would it ever work? Other, yeah, any customer? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any question? Mark? Good, good. You're getting at exactly the right thing. Uh, let's pass the mic. Basically, what you're saying is if there are repeated patterns in the data, 
then just by chance, I might end up with one state capturing two different instances of that. And then I can start sort of moving towards that optimum. Go ahead. So, I mean, Yeah. yeah, I think you guys are all getting at the right answer. And basically, the way to think about this is that this is not data independent. Basically, it sounds like you made up some data, and now you're just going to run this thing, and you're going to end up with that. But every time I go through this procedure, what I basically do is that I use, I'm constrained by the genome itself. Basically, even if I make up some crazy weird parameters, it's going to basically say, let's take those crazy weird parameters, apply it to the genome, and it will just annotate the part of the genome that looks like those crazy parameters one way. And on the second iteration, I've completely erased the parameters that I started with. I completely threw them away. All I'm left with is the true annotate the, the true data from the genome. The only thing that I've made up right now is that I've grouped the genome in some funny way. Okay? But I've grouped it in a funny way that was driven by a set of parameters. So now I've grouped it in a way that similar regions are in fact grouped together into the same hidden state. And that basically means that whatever similarity is there in those regions, will be then encoded in the parameters corresponding to that state. And at the beginning, it might be complete crap. But then the first time around, these regions are only vaguely similar according to some weird thing that I came up with. But then those vaguely similar regions, immediately on the second iteration, will exhibit whatever similarity they have as part of the parameters that we learned for those regions. And then as soon as I start getting up that hill, Boom, it's going to go very, very fast to whatever optimal partitioning there is. And if I learn some parameters that truly represent only one of these regions, or only three of these 20 regions, that's fine. Because on the next iteration, I'm going to have much better annotation of the regions based on these parameters that I've learned. Who's with me? Raise your hands. Awesome. Who feels that they've learned something? Raise your hands. Awesome. Good. So that basically is the key to why this expectation maximization procedure even works. Because every single time you go through, you're basically filtering through the data, the data, the data. The annotations are being driven by your initial parameters, but as soon as you have the state of annotations, all the parameters are driven by the, the genome and whatever is in there. Okay? Sounds good? So, yeah. Microphone? Uh, excuse me, microphone. So what, what, what you just described is just the abstract answer to my algorithm. I mean, what are the parameters? What is the initial gas? What is being updated? I don't feel like I have a grasp of what actually is going on. That's exactly right. <laughs> And that's why there are more slides to this lecture. <laughs> so let's talk exactly about that, okay? So let's talk about the simple case of Viterbi train, okay? So what I'm gonna do is, given some set of model parameters, and I think this is turning off because of batteries, so you should remember to change batteries. Um, you should see that light off right now. Thank you. Um, we're basically, we're going to pick some random parameters, and then what we're going to do is perform Viterbi. Basically, run the Viterbi algorithm and find pi star. Pi star will give me an optimal annotation of the best path that explains the genome given those random parameters. And then once I have that, I'm going to calculate the transition parameters and the emission parameters according to what I effectively have, which is an annotation of the genome. I'm back to the supervised learning situation, right? 
where I'm counting with some pseudo counts. And then once I have calculated those, you know, frequencies, I will have my new transition parameters and then I will basically perform Viterbi again and find the best path according to the new set of parameters. Does that answer your question? What are the, what is the update? After we do the, 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 division, and then this is just the Viterbi algorithm, yeah? Yes. No, we're random in generating some para model parameters. Once you have the model parameters, this is not random at all. You're running the Viterbi algorithm to generate an annotation. Yeah. Exactly, and then you're pretending that that annotation is the truth, and then you're simply counting the number of transition and emission uh, examples. Yeah. Um, it's the counts versus the parameters. <laughs> Basically, these are just the counts, and then these guys are actually the parameters. Is everybody... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the microphone. Uh, so I guess I was still unclear as to um, how you determine what your best guess is ever about your um, Right. <laughs> no, I mean, it, you know, I don't want to make too much of it, but random is the right answer. Basically, it, you know, you just don't know. So you, you could basically say that, oh, I'm just going to start with some higher GC and some lower GC. But that's just going to be bytes. Whereas if you really truly start with random, it'll just figure its way through the genome. But then, but then isn't the, the result of going through this process dependent on how you Correct, correct. Yeah, that's exactly right. So basically, what we end up doing in practice is starting in a bunch of random places, seeing how you converge, and then picking the model that has the maximum total probability. Hold on. Any other questions? Who's still confident that, hey, I got this? Raise your hands. Okay, awesome. Any other questions? Are you with me again or no? Do you see the, what, the computation that we did in the supervised learning case? Yeah. So therefore, you know, what, basically you're comfortable that if I have a path, I can just simply compute the parameters, right? A path is an annotation. So if I have a path, which gives me an annotation, I can just simply calculate the parameters. And are you comfortable about if I have a set of parameters, I can calculate the path? Good, I see you nodding. So you're 100% with me now? 90, 90 is good, I'll take 90. Well, there's two ways to do pseudocounts. One is to basically say, I have a prior expectation that promoters are going to be a small fraction of the genome and they're going to be higher GC, but I don't exactly know what. So I'm just going to set them at, you know, 0.6 and, you know, uh, GC content and maybe 0 0.05 frequency in the genome. That's, that's the first way of basically prior belief. The other way is I'm just going to make sure that there's no zero parameters. I'm going to just set things at, you know, 0 0.00001 more counts than what I observed in the genome. Okay? 
So these are the two settings. The first setting is I'm going to choose my pseudo counts in a way that biases the answer to where something I'm expecting to be right. The other way is I'm just going to try to avoid zero probability. Mm, no, because you're still incorporating basically supervised learning simply means I have an annotation of the genome and the story. Unsupervised learning means no one has told me what the genome looks like and where are the promoter regions. You could use pseudo counts to bias it towards just higher GC, but you still don't know where they are. You're going to learn that as you go. Does that make sense? Yeah. Microphone. So for gen scan, there was a lot of hard coding going on. For Chrome HMM, completely unsupervised. But, but whatever words you used at the beginning is how I feel about HMS. They're basically shockingly cool and amazing or something. Yeah, yeah, we can be right behind you. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you know, yeah, we, we asked that question before, and it's a level of complexity. You can use Bayesian information criterion, you can use, you know, uh, some threshold on the number of things I'm willing to just sit through and interpret myself and or experiment. Yeah, you basically have a very big hat and you just pull things out of it. All right. So this was simple unsupervised learning. Okay. This was Viterbi training where I'm simply taking the best path. But we already said how the best path might capture only a very small fraction of the total probability. So what we're gonna do now is do unsupervised way, the correct way, which is instead of asking how many times did the best path make a transition from promoter state to background state, or from state K to state L, what I'm going to ask is over all possible paths, how many times did I make the transition from state K to state L? And over all possible paths, and therefore annotations, how many times did I emit a G from state B and so on and so forth? Okay? So this is exactly the same thing conceptually. Oh gosh, my internet connection is unstable. It's exactly the same thing conceptually. But now, instead of only taking the best path, and then counting the number of KL transitions in that path, I'm going to, at every position, basically say, what is the total probability ending at state B? What is the total probability starting at state P, at positions I and I plus one, respectively? And what is the emission probability and the transition probability? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna estimate at every position the transition between two states as simply the total probability to enter that state, the total probability to exit that state, and then the number of KL transitions that I make between positions I and I plus one over all possible paths, each weighted by its probability, okay? Who can see what I'm vaguely talking about? Raise your hand. Okay. So what I'm basically doing is calculating all of the possible transitions that I can make from this state to that state. And the way to do that is to basically calculate the total forward va variable all the way to K at position I, the total backward variable all the way back to I plus one at state L, and then the transition from K to L, and then the emission from, you know, state L of this carrot, okay? 
So it is exactly the same thing as I was doing with Viterbi training. Only for Viterbi training, I was using my parameters to calculate the maximum path. And with Baum Welch training, I'm using my parameters to basically calculate all paths. And then summing over all those paths by effectively using this forward and reverse uh, computation, I can just compute the forward matrix for every state at every position, compute the backward matrix for every state at every position, and then I just go through the whole thing once more, basically say, you know, for every pair, how many times did I make that transition? And that gives me the number of times that I transition from one state to another state, summed over all paths, the number of times I emitted each character, summed over all paths, this and so forth. Basically, the way that I calculate AKL is summing over all paths of exactly this. And the way that I calculate the, you know, the EKB, the emission, is basically, again, summing over uh, you know, the entire sequence for all of this. Okay? Who's with me on this? Raise your hands. Awesome. Good. So this is basically the Don Welch algorithm. It's basically you calculate the forward, backward, and then the new log likelihood as the E step, and then the new parameters, and you know, and then I update the parameters. Basically, I annotate my sequence using this forward and backward algorithm, and then I count AKL and EKB using the new annotation, which is all paths. And then I calculate, you know, based on the new parameters, the forward and the backward algorithm again. Okay. So we've now gone through all of our algorithms, scoring, decoding, and learning using one path or all paths. And for the one path, we looked at supervised where we're given i, and unsupervised where we simply calculate a single path, which is a return path. Okay. I guess we're not going to talk about conditional random too. <laughs>